Hi everyone, this is Matt Touchot with Intro Stats, and today we're continuing our discussion about type 1 and type 2 errors. Uh, in our last video, we went over sort of the theory behind type 1 and type 2 errors and give some of the basic definitions uh, and the ideas. And today I wanted to look at a, an example just to give you an idea of what uh, a person in statistics or data science has to think about when they're dealing with this situation of type 1 and type 2 errors. So in our last video, we saw that a type 1 or type 2 error occurs when you think something's true about the population or the, the, your random sample data leads you to believe something's true about the population when it turns out later it's not true about the population. That is the big idea. You think something's true about these millions of people in the population and it turns out later it's not true. That's called a type 1 or type 2 error. Um, so we saw that a type 1 error uh, is sort of believing that the alternative hypothesis is true when it's really not and the type 2 error is sort of believing that the null hypothesis is probably true when it's really not. Okay? So let's look at an example where we kind of walk through this and I, I want to also think about what would be the recommendation, what would be, what would the statistician want to recommend um, that they do to sort of deal with the situation they're in. Every situation is different. So let's suppose we're doing a medication experiment. We want to prove that there's a new medicine that maybe it's a blood pressure medicine that decreases blood pressure. The goal of this medicine is to decrease blood pressure. Uh, remember, blood, high blood pressure, guys, is very dangerous, so make sure you're getting your blood pressure checked. Um, high blood pressure has a lot of bad, bad effects. So uh, if you do have high blood pressure, being on a blood pressure medicine makes a lot of sense. So, uh, but how, do, how would the company, let's suppose a pharmaceutical company uh, is trying to, you know, maybe uh, distribute this medicine to the population, but they have to get approval first. They have to make sure that the medicine actually works. So how would they do that? Well, they run in a, probably a randomized uh, experiment, right? They use a um, random assignment, all those things uh, that we talked about in our section on experiments about, you know, controlling confounding variables and so that they can prove cause and effect. They have to prove that the medicine works. So uh, we'll look at the, suppose we're looking at the population mean blood pressure for those people that are on the medicine in the treatment group and versus the people that are, uh, that are taking a placebo. We call, sometimes call that the control group. So the population mean blood pressure for those on the control group. Again, the treatment group and the control group should be very, very alike. The people should be very identical. And that's, again, what sort of um, deals with uh, controlling for confounding variables and allowing you to prove cause and effect. But let's get to the sort of the, the null and alternative hypothesis. So the null hypothesis would be that the blood pressures were about the same. So if the blood pressures for the people on the medicine and the people on the placebo are about the same, that's telling you the medicine doesn't work. The medicine really is having no effect. It's not really lowering people's blood pressure. They're not much lower than the people that are on the placebo. That's not good, right? If that was the case, if this is true, then I probably am not going to approve this medicine for use with the population. Okay? The alternative hypothesis would be that the medicine does do what it says. It has the effect desired. It lowers people's blood pressure. So I would expect that the population mean blood pressure for people on the medicine is significantly lower than the population, uh, the percentage, sorry, the population mean average blood pressure for those on the placebo group. Now, if that's the case, then probably the medicine might be approved. We still have to check for side effects and other things like that. But in terms of, does the medicine do what it's supposed to do, right? Does it lower people's blood pressure? If that's the case, then it might get approved for use by the population. So think of it this way. We can't let the medicine be sold to millions of people around the world unless we're kind of sure that this medicine does what it says it does and that it's relatively safe. So, um, so, we have to do a, 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 we take a sample of people uh, in an experiment and we try to figure out does this medicine do what it's supposed to do, right? But that decision is going to be made from sample data. That's what people don't realize. You have to make this sort of decision based on sample data and now you're going to decide what's, what's going to be done with this medicine for the millions of people in the population. Okay, so 
Uh, anytime you use sample data to make a decision about something that's going to affect millions of people in the population, you basically have the, to think about very carefully what the type 1 and type 2 errors might be in the situation. Okay? So let's kind of walk, walk through it a little bit. Remember, a type 1 error goes with getting a low p-value and uh, thinking that HA is correct. You're sort of supporting the HA. You're rejecting the null hypothesis and supporting HA. So you think the alternative is correct when it turns out it's not. So this is, a, remember, an error means that the sample data was biased somehow and led you to think something was true that turns out later it's not. Okay, so think about it this way. So let's suppose we believe HA is correct. I, I did the experiment. It had control all the confounding variables. I did random assignment. I did all of the things I'm supposed to do with a good experiment. And it came out with a low p-value. Right? And I'm like, all oh, right, yes, I got a low p-value. So a low p-value means it's unlikely to be sampling variability. We're rejecting the null and supporting the alternative. In other words, this low p-value is now would give me evidence that the medicine works, right? That's kind of what I'm thinking. But remember, if it was a type 1 error, this low p-value is actually not reflective of the population, right? It's, it's coming from this, for whatever reason, this sample data, the, the people in this experiment were not reflective of the population. In other words, yes, when in, in the people in the experiment, the, the medicine seemed to lower their blood pressure. But maybe when this medicine hits the open market and millions of people start taking it, we're going to see a lot of people that it has no effect on. Right? So that would be a type 1 error. So I think this is true, right? All right the, the, the experiment, the sample data in the experiment indicates that the medicine should be approved. But it's a mistake. Right? It's a... It's a not so much that it's a mistake as it is just, I think this is true based on my sample data and all of my, all of my statistics, but it turns out later that's not true. Okay? Maybe if we did the experiment again, it would indicate no effect with the medicine. So what would be the consequences of that? We have to think about that. What would be the consequences of me approving a medicine that turns out later doesn't work? Right? So, I mean, a type 1 error would be thinking HA is correct when it's really not. So, I'm approving this medicine because my experiment showed the medicine works, but that experiment came from sample data, and so for some reason that sample data was not reflective of the population. What consequences could that have? Seems like that would have bad consequences, wouldn't it? I mean, that would indicate, I mean, if we had, a, if we had some bad consequences... This would be a bad type 1 error. I mean, I'm releasing a medicine, a blood pressure medicine, a very dangerous, this can be very dangerous if we have people that are walking around with high blood pressure, they're taking medicine, they think they're getting, their blood pressure is going down, but it's really not. So, the consequence of a type 1 error would be, right, the I, I approve the sale of a medicine to millions of people, that does not work. Yikes, that's scary. That's a scary type 1 error. That's a bad type 1 error. Because you can think about the, the consequences of that, right? I mean, could people die? Yeah, yeah, you could have deaths. Right? You could have people dying if they, if they approved a medicine, if, they, if all of a sudden they start selling a medicine that doesn't work. You could have deaths from people from high blood pressure. Could they sue? Could the people sue? In, in the U.S., we tend to sue a lot. So, yeah, I think you could have lawsuits, right? You could definitely have lawsuits for if they turned out later that, that the medicine doesn't work and they, and they released uh, and they um, approved sale of the medicine. So this is a really bad, anytime deaths is on your consequence list, you're going to try to stop that error at all costs. So for me, right out of the gate, I see type 1 error is about as bad as it's going to get. I want to make sure type 1 error doesn't happen. So what am I going to do? 
Well, what we learned last time in our theory is you decrease the significance level, right? The probability of making a type 1 is your significance level. I'm not keeping my significance level at 5% here. There's no way. That's too high if deaths are involved. I'm going to lower it, right? I'm going to lower my significance level. I'll probably lower my significance level, maybe lower it to 1% or maybe even half a percent. I'll go lower than 1%, whatever. I'm going to lower that significance level very, very low to keep the probability of this happening very low. Okay? So, but what about type 2? Right? Well, we, we talked about type 1 looks really bad. What about type 2? What, what could be the consequence of making a type 2 error? All right, well, type 2 error is sort of the opposite. Like the, the, meta, the experiment indicated a high p-value. So in other words, when, when we did the experiment, it seemed like the placebo group and the medicine groups had about the same blood pressure. They didn't show really any tangible effect. In other words, in the, in the experiment, in the people uh, in the experiment, it did not have the effect of lowering their blood pressure significantly. Right? Okay, well that's going to tell me maybe the medicine doesn't work, right? The sample data is sort of indicating that this medicine doesn't work. I should stop it from being sold. So I should say, no, 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 you can't stop sold to sell this medicine to millions of people because it's, it, it, our experiment is indicating it doesn't work. Right? But remember, it's a type 2 what? Error. That means this is wrong. It means for some reason my sample data, my people in the experiment, just it wasn't having an effect on them for some reason. But if this medicine was used on millions of people, maybe most of them would be just fine and it would decrease their blood pressure. Maybe it's been used other places in the world for many years and maybe it does decrease blood pressure. So but my experiment, for whatever reason, this random sample is not reflecting the population and it showed that they, the medicine was not effective, when in actuality it is effective. So remember, a type 1 and type 2 errors is thinking something's true that turns out later is not true. So I think the medicine doesn't work, right? That's what the experiment is telling me. But it turns out later it does work, right? If it was opened up to millions of people, it actually would, could be used. So what would be that? So that's like stopping, you're sort of stopping